This week on Intrigued, full effect. That internal struggle that he was going through with the shame of living a gay lifestyle, with the shame of doing whatever he was doing that maybe only he knew about, that he knew I wouldn't approve of or his loved ones wouldn't approve of. I, I think that really made his day-to-day -day life tumultuous. You couldn't meet a nicer guy to have a conversation with. I'm Shandrea Thomas, and welcome to Episode 9. In this podcast, I talk about curious cases, disappearances, and other stuff. And today I'm talking about the disappearance of 19-year-old Christian Muse from Fort Washington, Maryland. This is a wild story filled with tragedy and layered with heartbreak and despair. And along with that comes investigations into teen prostitution, pornography, and more. There were some shocking discoveries about Christian's life and those he left behind. I spoke to his father, Michael Muse, who is also the lead singer for the R&B group, The Stylistics. He was very candid about his relationship with Christian and the issues that affected his son's life that sent him down a dark path. And I reached out to St. George's County Police about the case. This is what happened. It was July 15, 2012, and according to Michael, it was somewhat of a typical day. Then at around 10 o'clock that night, Michael says Christian told him that he was going out and that he would be back, but he never returned. Then a few days later, Christian was spotted in the Glass Manor area of Voxon Hill in Maryland, and that's when he disappeared. Christian hasn't had any contact with his family since July 15th. As for his bank account, it hasn't been touched. By the 20th, Michael filed a missing persons report. So we jumped right into the interview, and I have to say the first part of our conversation about Christian had me shook. Michael revealed from the beginning that his son had issues with the law, but he says it was caused by alleged abuse that he didn't find out about until later on in his son's young life. So tell me, what happened on July 15th of 2012? Well, July 15th, 2012 was just a culmination of everything that my son had been going through. One day, um, Christian just broke down in the kitchen because we, we started to think the kid may have some mental issues. I mean, who keeps touching a hot stove getting burned and just keeps doing it over and over again? So. He broke down one day in the kitchen and he told us that he had an older cousin who I considered a relative on his mom's side, who's seven years older than Christian, who had been molesting him since he was three years old. Mm. So age of three to 16, when he finally disclosed it to us, he had been being molested by an older male cousin. So there you have it. That made everything start to make sense as to why he kept acting up. It was just a release of his pain, frustration, and confusion and shame because needless to say, if you grab a little boy that young and emotionally damage him, he's going to be confused about his sexuality, the whole nine. So, you know, with Christian being a rough tumble type kid, you know, leader of the pack to know that he was living a double life kind of brought him shame, you know, amongst his peers and everything. But I had a long talk with him and I assured him that what happened to him was not his fault. And the decisions that he's facing because of that emotional damage is something that I will be there every step of the way to help him with. But of course, at that age, the kids know more than their parents and he didn't want to cooperate with the psychologist that we was trying to get him to talk to who specialized in abuse children. The whole nine. So one thing led to another. Drugs got involved. Uh, the, the, constantly getting in trouble, didn't stop. Uh, he started to jeopardize the safety of my house. So let me step back a little bit. When it comes to this cousin who was abusing him, whatever happened to that person? Was there ever any legal situation with that or what happened? Well, what we did, we filed charges. Uh, again, that, that was his mom's first cousin. We filed charges and the police basically told us that if Christian's not going to cooperate, we don't have a case because there were no witnesses involved. This may be something I'm sure that as Christian got older, he may have even initiated from time to time because that's all he knew. You know, but, you know he was still underage. And once that person turned 21 and Christian was still a teen, then it became statutory rape. Um, 
But he didn't want to cooperate. So it wasn't much we could do about it. And the police basically told us the bare truth that they didn't have a case to pursue um, because there were no witnesses. And there was more. After the abuse revelation, Michael says he found out about Christian being involved in pornography with other guys as a teenager. He had no idea it was happening at the time and found out from Christian's twin sister. He says classmates of his twins saw Christian performing sex acts on tape. He also believes it was all part of an online sex trafficking ring. To add fuel to the fire, to put salt on the wound, Christian accepted money when he was a minor from this organization of monsters. And what they were doing, they were recruiting young boys to have gay sex on the Internet and people would pay to see it. The police finally caught up with them. So nine months after Christian disappeared, a a detective from D.C., who was working in conjunction with the FBI, were looking for all these boys involved, I guess, to use as witnesses to solidify their case against these people. They showed me pictures of about 14 different boys, none of which they could find, including Christian. So how did you find out that he was involved with this stuff? Was he, he was a teenager? Did you find out on accident? How no, did you discover? He, he told us pictures start surfacing. Uh, my daughter, his sister, she got a text from somebody saying, I saw your brother on the Internet having sex. Then they forwarded the link to her. She showed it to me. And then I confronted him about, him about it. And that's when he fessed up and told me he had taken money to do this. But he was between 15 and 16 years old when he participated in this. How did that whole situation stop with him being involved with that whole sex trafficking or whatever sex thing that was going on? Well, all I could do was take his word for it on that. No new video surfaced, to my knowledge. He said he wasn't participating in it anymore. Uh, I don't know what the police FBI case involved with that, but the website doesn't exist anymore. But that doesn't mean that, you know, those those monsters have stopped taking advantage of children. Michael says he was sure that the new revelation about his son's involvement in the supposed FBI investigation would spark interest in Christian's case. But he was wrong. It's like giving that information to a black hole because nothing became of it. But you would think once the lead detective on Christian's disappearance got all this information, how big you think it would be, it really turned out to to just be a a fizzle. Nothing happened. Did Christian tell you why he was getting involved with that? Was it a offshoot of molestation and kind of him having some confusion about what he wanted to do with himself or? I really believe so with, uh, you know, all teenagers want money. And if he had been willingly or unwillingly living that lifestyle anyway, you know, his mindset might have said, why not get paid for it? You know what I mean? Um, but the, the, the psychological damage of it is a, a whole nother thing. And what he didn't realize was that it could manifest itself in a whole bunch of different ways then and maybe even in the future, God forbid. And he didn't want to seek the help that we were trying to uh, give him through, through the child psychologist. And so essentially, once all these things started to emerge, you realized that your son was living a double life. Yes. Yes. One that even his close friends, his his heterosexual friends who he grew up with in the neighborhood, who he played football with, who he boxed with, who he fought with, all the boy stuff. Those set of friends knew nothing about or did not know any of the other set of people that he was dealing with and hanging out with. Did your son ever come out to you as being gay? No. Only when he told me about, you know, what had happened with um, with his cousin. And then after that, we started to see signs, you know, and he finally admitted that he liked boys and girls. You know, as a parent, I'm sure that's a lot to even handle. I'm curious when it comes to your last conversation with Christian, what was that conversation and what was that day like? Do you remember? I'm sure you do. Well, he was he was going through a lot that day. He um. I think he had gotten a fight that day after he got in a fight. He went and got high. And I think his drug of choice may have been PCP at the time. Uh, there was a, a lot of stealing going on, things missing from a house because of his drug use. The whole nine, you know, my son wasn't an angel, but I, I do 
attribute all his because the kid was smart. Christian made the honor roll twice in his senior year at, at Oxon Hill Senior High School, and he was determined to graduate. You know, a lot of people say he may be have been running because he was on probation. Christian never missed a probation meeting. He was always on time. His probation officer loved him. She saw, always praised him about how well he was doing in school, the whole nine. We had been off and on arguing that day, just trying, just me being a dad, trying to keep him in line, you know, and, and giving him the, the, the advice that, that I think young men going through those growing pains need, you know. But when he left, he did say, Dad, I love you. I'll see you later, basically. And um, he never came back. At the time of Christian's disappearance, he had just finished some college classes and was looking for work as an HVAC technician. After dealing with robbery charges, Michael says that Christian was trying to get his life back on track. Uh, He had finished some college courses that PG County Community College had offered and got some certifications and trade things like HVAC, uh, uh, drywall, stuff like that, that he could get a quick, easy job with. So he was doing quite well, but I guess his demons got the best of him. And he decided maybe even for our own safety, that it's time for him to leave. Cause there's no doubt he left on his own, but apparently mm-hmm. something happened to him or he gotten involved with some dangerous people or something to that effect once he left. And the, the conclusion that I draw Whatever the reason is that he's not here, it's not by his own free choice. I really believe that someone's holding something over his head or maybe threatening to do us some type of harm if he resurfaces. But it's not by his own free will that he's not here. I know one thing is for sure. This story became more and more intriguing as we talked. It was cool between him and I when he left. And another thing, Christian had a young lady pregnant when he disappeared uh she is the last known person that i know of that spoke to him because we we converse throughout the years and and when he first went missing she told us that she talked to christian like three or four days after he disappeared and uh he wouldn't tell her where he was but he did say he was going to come to north carolina and for them to start a family and raise their child together and that was the last that she heard of him from him Then Michael dropped another bombshell. He got some shocking news more than six years after his son's disappearance. Uh, The little girl's six years old now. We just Mm. got the DNA test results back two weeks ago and found out that I am a grandfather. Uh, Because for a long time, I didn't know that they could actually use my DNA to to, to, uh, determine paternity. So Uh I'm a grandfather six-year-old angel and her dad is missing and um you know we we just want to find some answers how is the the twin sister handling everything that is a great question um just put it this way with them and i've heard it uh, stories about a lot of twins i know they have a a spiritual metaphysical connection that i really can't explain just to give you an example when my ex and i first got separated christian lived with me and my daughter lived with my ex-wife so what we would do we would try to get them together at least once a week or at the end of the week to you know so they could still have that bond but at one given point for whatever reason i don't remember what happened they hadn't seen each other or been around each other for an entire month and they caught the chicken pox on the same day She's really starting to worry a lot, and it, it, it leaves her in a state of confusion where she really can't get her own self together. And she's pregnant now. She's about to give me a grandson in May. So she's going through some things, and, uh, you know, her biggest obstacle or her biggest uh, burden in life right now is not knowing where her twin brother is. What do you know about the status of his case right now? All I know is that PG County police, I I, I, I will give them one thing on this side. They're they're overburdened because when when they first took on my case, a female detective uh, who was in charge of the case told me basically she was the only person in the missing persons division for the entire District 4 of PG County. Just her. She had no assistant, no squad, no team, just her. 
So I guess the priority cases would be elderly people with Alzheimer's or small children. A young black male with a juvenile record is not going to be on their top priority to try to find him. That just goes without saying. But for them not to have the manpower or resources to even look into as many cases as possible, I think it's a shame. That speaks a lot on county government administration and where they're putting their dollars. You know, that's really not her fault. But what I do blame on them is that they only seem to show interest when they know the media is about to be involved. I've done several TV interviews over the years, and it seems like as soon as they find out about that, that's when I start receiving the phone calls. Uh, you know, we've been doing everything we can and blah, blah, this and blah, but they have no answers. And basically, the first detective used to call me asking me, have I heard it? Well, what are you doing? You know, I've given them leads before that they didn't follow up on. Uh, I don't even know if she ever even talked to the last person that he was with, which was a neighbor of mine by the name of Lonnie who dropped him off around the corner. And he says that's that's the last he saw of Christian. And he was waiting on somebody to come and pick him up. Well, when the detective went to talk to Lonnie, Lonnie wasn't home. And I don't think she ever spoke with Lonnie. How can you not talk to the last person that he was with? I reached out to Prince George's County Police multiple times to try and get an update on the case, and I've gotten emails directing me to various people who I then reached out to, and as of now, there is still no response on the state of the case. But I did find some recent media reports about the case, and according to local news outlets, the case is still open and it's assigned to a detective. So basically what you know about the case from police at this point is that it's still just an open case no new leads no anything other than what you already know exactly and what what really teed me off with them is that when the case was changed over to another detective they didn't notify me so i'm trying to get in touch with the first detective the case had been given to another detective who handled it maybe about a week or two and then it got switched to another detective and i didn't know that either until she actually knocked on my door when I wasn't home, asking mm-hmm. my oldest son on things involving the case. Switch mm-hmm. their computer or their case system from paper to computer. And when Channel 9 here in D.C. wanted a case number, they couldn't provide one because they couldn't find the case number. And I'm like, what? what is going on? How can you not have a case number to a missing person? You are, I would say, you have a, a, a celebrity status there. You're a musician. How hard was it for you to get media coverage for your son's story? It was surprisingly difficult. And I don't know why. When it comes to theories about what you believe may have happened, tell Mm -hmm. me what you're thinking. What are the streets telling you? What information have you been able to gather? Tell me about some of the theories. Well, I I can't call them theories. When I get into theories, I'm thinking of Big Brother and the evil people that rule the world and what they may be doing to our young people as far as organ harvesting and sex trafficking and all of that. I really don't think it's that deep. What I do believe possibly is that Christian got in trouble with some people here locally who are not good people and they may be using drugs to keep him away. Uh, They may actually be using him as a male prostitute, uh, keeping him on drugs to keep him away. Uh, But even being on drugs, that really doesn't make any sense to me because honestly, and I'm not ashamed of it, I went through my spill with the drug life during the 80s, during the crack crack epidemic, and there was nothing in the world that would keep me away from my family. If anything, I would go to my family telling them a bunch of lies, trying to get money to get drugs, you know what I mean? So I can't say it's a drug thing that's just keeping him away. I think Christian really is in deep with someone that's threatening our life or his life if he resurfaces. That, that's, that's what I believe. I have seen, as I was researching the story, you know, ideas about maybe some amnesia, and like mm-hmm. you said, maybe the sex trafficking, and I've seen witness protection as a possibility out there. Those are things that kind of went through your mind, too? Yeah, well, as a parent, everything goes through your mind. And needless to say, I, I have the craziest dreams about what could possibly be going on with him. And I think when it's all said and done, it may even be something that I never 
thought of. We've heard, and, and what makes it even crazier, we've heard so many different things. We've heard about three different sources that he was killed. The first being some guy that ran into his old girlfriend at a restaurant, and he was basically telling her he knows who killed him. This was early into him being missing. Uh, but he's not going to say anything. He deserved to die. The detective at the time did catch up with this guy and talk to him at his job. But of course, he denied saying any of that stuff. That's one of the people we heard. Someone was in jail and said Christian was buried in the woods in Arizona. But we've also heard that he was just seen in Forestville, Maryland, January of 2017. You know, so it, it really gives you nothing to gravitate towards because the stories just don't add up so you don't know where to start you know did you check into the witness protection uh option and if they do tell us anything all they can tell us is that he's in a program and he's okay they can't send pictures no whereabouts no nothing that actually leads me to my next question do you feel that your son is still alive do you in your spirit do you believe that i do I do. And maybe that's just the faith that I have, uh, because right now that's 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 all we have. And, but there's also a realist side to me. And I try to tell this to my daughter, but she doesn't want to hear it, that there's a possibility that he's not. I'm leaning towards he is because she hasn't gotten that feeling yet. You know, they say a lot of times a mom will get that feeling if something happens to a child, she can just feel it. Neither his mother or her have gotten that feeling. Uh, but I do believe he is in danger at all times with wherever and whatever he's involved in. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe constant danger. When it comes to the whole situation involving Christian's disappearance, what mm -hmm. do you think was the most shocking thing that you discovered? About him or about the whole situation? Just about him and about the situation. Well, what was shocking to me was that with me being so well known in the area that nobody has stepped forward and gave me any concrete lead. I mean, everybody knows me. You know, I, don't, I, I can't say I know everybody, but if you do music in a town small as D.C. for over 30 years, everybody knows of you. I mean, go-go music in D.C. is like what jazz is to New Orleans or what reggae is to Jamaica. And as much as we put that story out, everybody knows about it, but no one has stepped forth with saying, yeah, I've gotten phone calls from people who, who care and were willing to lend their help. Like, yeah, I saw your son on New York Avenue. You need to get up there. But of course, it would always be a person who I saw him, didn't really know it was him. But then when I got down Street to the second light, I realized that was him, and then I went back and he was gone. Nobody ever has the clarity of mind to say, damn it, that's him. Let me take a picture. No, I mean, that that's what's frustrating, because it seems like anything else that happened, people have their cameras ready, and then it's on Facebook immediately. But when they see him, their cameras are never ready. Did you, did you guys ever conduct any searches for him or have any idea of where to look for him? Did that ever happen over the course of all this time? Organized searches, no. People on foot just passing out flyers in the different neighborhoods Christian used to frequent. Uh, of course, me being a part-time Uber driver, I carry a big poster in my car while I'm driving Uber. And anybody 30 and under that gets in my car, I show them that poster and I start asking questions. Um, mm. I actually had a few passengers that know him or know of the story or even went to school with him. But nobody knows anything. Did you uncover anything that you had no idea about once he was gone? No, not really. Because anything, you know, we found a few of his writings. He used to sit down and write his thoughts. And a lot of it was very depressing stuff. But that all made sense because of what he had went through. So that didn't shock me to find that. The, the part about him being molested was the shocking part because... This this person that did it, I looked at him like a, he was a kid when I met him. Who would ever think that a, a, a 10 year old kid would be molesting a three year old baby? And that's his cousin. You know, you always think maybe the stepdad or mom's boyfriend or some creepy neighbor. But you, for another child to be the one that was very shocking and for it to continue as long as it did without Christian saying anything. 
that was shocking. But everything I've learned about pedophiles and child molesters, nine times out of ten, they've been molested. Uh, they groom their victims. And what's what's <laughs> interesting about that is, you know, when you look at the whole process of that from age three on up, I mean, at the end of the day, it left him broken. It exactly. left him broken. Yeah. I, as far as homosexuality, my oldest son is openly gay. And my son was born that way. I, I don't believe in the theory that people choose to be gay or whatever. A truly gay person like my oldest son, he was born that way. The boy wanted to jump rope at two years old and play with dolls and the whole feminine thing. Christian, on the other hand, and, and the police have a term for it as well. It's called the vampire effect. You can emotionally damage a child, male or female, to the point where they are confused about their sexuality and will willingly participate on either side. You know, they didn't necessarily have to be born that way. Tell me about the impact that Christian's disappearance has had on your family. Well, it's affected all facets of my life. In most urban settings in America, young black men, we're, we're taught to be tough. You know, don't be a punk. Uh, nothing can phase me. I'm the alpha male, the whole nine. Uh, but this invisible thing called depression has honestly creeped up on me to the point where some days I will actually not come out of the house for three days. I can't, I just can't pull myself out of the bed. Um, I've had hell. I had a health issues before he disappeared with back problems. My body's in constant soreness all the time, but a little, a little bit after he disappeared, I, I, I found out I had heart disease. Uh, Needless to say, I may have brought it on myself by engaging in drinking and using pain medicine, trying to alleviate the pain of him disappearing. But that's something I deal with now as well. Um, I can't work a nine to five anymore because of my health issues. So my income has severely been <laughs> severely taken a blow. Uh, bills are piling up. And with all that, I find mom dead on the floor two years ago. Uh, mm. some, and why are you not in a straitjacket? So what I do, I attribute it to all those prayers. My grandmother used to pray over me when I was three years old. And I didn't know what she was saying or doing. But those are the prayers that are holding me together now. And then I still have my daughter. And she's about to give me a granddaughter. I got a, a grandson. I have a, There are other people that I have to be strong for. But it is certainly taking its toll. I'm not the same confident, strong, cocky Michael Muse that I was before my son disappeared, you know. In desperation to find Christian, Michael offered up his 401k for information that could lead him to his son. He also has a four-year-old GoFundMe campaign that's still up and running as a reward to bring Christian home. His goal is one hundred thousand dollars, but as of now, it still stands at twenty eight hundred. He also recently entered his DNA into the NamUs system. When it comes to the challenges of the investigation, what do you see those challenges being? Time, of course. You know, the older a case gets, the the harder it is to solve it with missing persons. You know what I mean? Um. And then just the fact, I mean, I'm never going to stop saying that we live in America and a lot of people wonder why we say black lives matter. The point of it is we shouldn't have to say it, but we do. And I think on a larger scale, this is a young black male who was almost a man when he went missing, who had a criminal record. So in the eyes of the law, (laughs) some of them may be thinking, well, he ain't on the street. Maybe that's better for society. Who knows what they're thinking, you know? So mm-hmm. all the internal thoughts and feelings that people get hidden, keep hidden, that's a big obstacle too. And and just speaking with other black families who've had molestation cases in their family, I think the molestation thing in black families is a lot more prominent than we care to talk about. It's something that I think black families have kept taboo for years. And one thing about a lot of black folks, we weren't ones to seek the emotional and psychological help that we would need after going through something like that. Even as a parent, there there may be 
some organization that I may need to talk to to get me through this. But just the way I was brought up tells me you're not going to psychologist. That means you're admitting you're crazy or whatever, you know, and I think things like that need to be talked about more within the black community, molestation especially. I'm finding through talking to people that a lot more people have gone through that or no relatives that have than I would have imagined 10 years ago is a bigger problem in, in our families than than men has talked about. Is there anything uh, new that, um, that you haven't talked about before publicly that you want to share or have you pretty much put it all out there? I, I've put it out there. I have. I mean, I, I'm trying everything I can. I always say I, I do have this huge idea in mind, and, I, I don't, and nothing's too big for God, I believe. But one thing I would love to do is get uh, uh, an event called Bikes Across America. And what I would want to do is get whoever wanted to join, celebrities, regular folks, working folks. I want to take a ride from D.C. to San Diego on bicycles. And everybody gets a sponsor. We'll blow it up and make it as big newsworthy as possible, you know, for whatever missing loved one you want. I mean, of course, the, the, the face of it will be Christian. But if anybody has missing loved ones or just want to support Christian or a cause of their missing loved one, let's get some sponsors and take this ride across America and bring attention to missing kids. It's just so much going on. And it's just like it's us. So. People don't seem to care if every two weeks a little white boy or girl went missing in Gaithersburg or, or Germantown, Potomac, Maryland, you know, people with money and, and a different complexion. Would it be newsworthy then? Because since Christian has been missing, definitely, I'm going to say at least five to six hundred kids have gone missing. Michael says even though his son had some struggles with the darkness in his life, he tries to remember the good times Christian shared with his family. It was the life of the party. Anytime we would have family gatherings, if he didn't there, wasn't there on time, everybody was like, well, where's Christian? When's he coming? Uh, because as soon as he got there, you know, it was time to, time to Joan or shoot the dozens, whatever you want to call it. Um, he loved to play games with the family, whether it be spades or, uh, and then if his record came on, he couldn't dance, but he would try to dance. And that's what made it even funnier. And, and everybody knew how loyal he was to his family. So you couldn't meet a nicer guy to have a conversation with. You, know, you could meet a nicer or loyal friend if you became friends with him. I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy. If, if 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 I got a knock on the door for them telling me to come and identify a body and it was him, that would be a relief at this point. It's the not knowing that is torture. When it comes to my final thoughts about this case, I can't help but think about where Christian went and why. Did he see something he wasn't supposed to see? Did he get wrapped up in a situation that put him and his family in danger? Is he in witness protection? Was the porn ring he was involved in part of his disappearance? I also think about how broken Michael said Christian was after being molested as a child and the impact that had on his life and his choices. And as a result, he seemed to be struggling with his sexuality. Christian was a young man with a lot happening in his life with a father who was trying to save him. And now, more than six years later, Michael gets confirmation that Christian has a six-year-old daughter. All I can say to that is, wow. The family may not have Christian, but they do have a piece of him to carry on. For some reason, I thought if someone had some degree of celebrity status, it would help. But in Michael's case, it didn't. It was also striking to me that Mr. Muse talked about the issue of molestation within black families. I really wasn't expecting him to get into that. But it is a taboo subject that people really don't talk about in general. I hope that someone will hear Christian's story and come forward with information that can let the family know where he is so they can have some degree of closure. Christian, as of March 1st, would be 26 years old. He's 6 feet tall, about 145 pounds. He has a tattoo of CM under his left eye and a bird on his neck along with other tattoos on his body. If you have any information on Christian's whereabouts, call the Prince George's County Police at 301-352-1200. 
Thank you for listening to episode nine. If you have any cases or disappearances that you want me to check out, just message me on the Intrigued Full Effect website or via email at intriguedfulleffect at hotmail.com. Until next time, be safe and stay true. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the Intrigued Full Effect, Curious Cases, Disappearances, and Other Stuff podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of the host. The primary purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform. The host of this podcast assumes no liability or responsibility for any activities in connection with opinions shared in the podcast. The podcast and blog associated with it shall not be used in any legal capacity or as a basis for expert testimony. Any copyright material in the podcast is approved by the owner or as part of the public domain. Music by Pond5.